This is Lloyd Hopkins. We are back inside the teacher's lounge. Let's jump back into the conversation. So we have a, a pandemic and we kind of talked about how you've been handling it personally and at home, but now you have to prepare for a school year. Now you have to teach kids in the middle of a, of a plant pandemic and you have to consider their health and not only their health, but your health, you know? So um, has your school decided how they're, uh, has your school decided whether they're going virtual or in person yet? Um, well, we're virtual until October 13th for sure. Now they might okay. extend that depending. Um, so we have already started school actually. Um, let's see. So it's been totally different to start the school year like this. I got to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been pretty, um, it's been kind of a weird experience so far. I, it's not bad, but it's not good. You know what I mean? Like I miss yeah. my kids. Um, I would say you don't have as much of a connection going virtual that you normally would, you know, start to form with them. Um, so it's definitely more, I have to talk it, more, uh, like they're far away. More, you know what I mean? Obviously. <laughs> yeah, I, they, they call it distance learning for a reason because it's, right. it's distant. And one thing I've learned just from my work with, with teachers is that teachers are very much into ritual. And, 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 and becoming a teacher, you're indoctrinated in a certain way, you know, in a certain philosophy and a way of teaching. And that's in person. What you is your classroom, 30 to 40 kids, 25 kids, whatever the number is, um, classroom management. And sometimes it's hard to get teachers to break out of that 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 framework or out of that thought process and adjust to a new way of teaching, you know. And some some do it easier than others. So I could just imagine of uh, the fish out of water feeling it is, you know, because you're used to the in person and having the kids in front of you, and now you have to discover a new way, you know. So have you? Have you got, have you all been going through like trainings or have they been sending you TED talk videos to watch? You know, how are <laughs> how are they helping you prepare for this? So we've actually had to physically go into this school and teach from like an empty classroom. Mm. Um prior to that, we did have two weeks of training on it. I will say that the, like exactly what you said, like we're very um systematic. We know what we want to do, you know, like every day we start with spell work and then we do this. And so it's like all of your practices and all of your routines and procedures like just go out the window and so that's been my biggest issue is like not having my routines and procedures that I'm so used to doing with my kids um in the same sense though it's good because I think it is kind of the future I think that students I mean whether they come into school to learn or they're at home to learn they're going to be on their computers so I kind of feel like it's, we're going in the right direction of the way society is going but at the same time it's it's a big change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I definitely feel like it is time for us to reimagine systems in general, you know, because uh, I think this pandemic has really exposed so much waste, you know, so much wasted space, so much wasted energy, systems that we've been so dependent on that maybe we're too dependent on or we really don't need. Um, and I think our, our classrooms and our schools haven't been innovated in 100 years. You know, how instruction has been delivered has been the same for 100 years. We don't allow any system to stay the same for 100 years. And somehow we've allowed education to escape big innovation. You know, and I, and I personally feel like there's a better way to deliver instruction. You know, I think there's a better way for us to create empathetic classrooms that better serve different learning styles, um, different different backgrounds, different personality traits, you know, um, and, 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 and I hope that, that this moment forces us and our school leaders and our education community to really dig in to some of that stuff and, and maybe discover some better ways that we can approach, you know, um, so you're teaching in a in an empty classroom. I, I, so I'm kind of envisioning you like the NBA, how they're in a bubble, and you know, and the uh, and the fans are watching them on these TV on these digital screens around the arena. That's like you in the classroom. You're in there by yourself. And you got a, all your kids on a on a uh, on a screen. So what's been kind of the um, most unique 
thing that you've done to prepare a pandemic classroom? Um, I've done a ton of um, research and like professional development on digital learning and like I, I've looked at other teachers' blogs and what they do and um, I guess getting the families on board and getting the students just able to sign in is, has been a huge task that I kind of wasn't prepared for. I didn't think the kids would struggle so much with just like, you know, typing in their, their username and a passcode, but they do. And it kind of blows my mind. It's just very eye-opening for me. Even though we use computers in, in our classrooms last year, you know, here and there a little bit, but um, I guess I never realized how how much they don't have that background using a computer. And, so and it's mind blowing, just, especially in the year twenty twenty, because you yeah. know we think about this being this information age, social media, the, the tech boom, and all of that kind of stuff. But there's still a lot of kids, uh, especially in low income communities, that don't have access to devices at home you know read they don't have reasonable access and the only time they do use these things is at school so they're so 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 many kids are really being left behind and that's why we launched the um our title one tech initiative where we partnered uh because it's all about you know we need to not only get kids kept caught up but we also need to prepare them for the world they're inheriting and so they need to be sophisticated on utilizing technology because this is going to be the way of the world and if we don't if we want to equip our schools to properly teach them these type of things um um they're going to be just that they're going to be a step behind you know in the workforce and when they pursue pursue higher education are going to be a step behind so it's so it's super important super important yeah um the other big thing that's going on in the world right now um, when, you know, because we don't have the luxury of just being able to focus on one thing, right? Like I, when in March, I thought the pandemic was going to be all that we had to deal with this year. But right. then we have the situation that happens with George Floyd and and how that situation and, and seeing that man unjustly murdered, you know, um, un uh, really... Um, through fire on the conversation that was already happening uh, around social justice, um, um, reform of our justice system, reform of our police departments, uh, and led to this bigger conversation about equality, and for me, a bigger conversation about equity. I believe that schools are the great equalizers. Schools can impact and undo and, and address so many of society's ills if schools properly equip teachers and, and uh, properly equip teachers with the resources and if schools have the tools to really address these type of things. There's been a lot of conversation around inequity in, in, in the curriculum and, and creating a more inclusive curriculum, like having history books that tell uh, all of our history or a more accurate version of the history what, on whatever side of that conversation that you're on. Um, so schools do play a part. And I think teachers have a maybe an unfair responsibility, you know, but have a, a responsibility at this point to play a part in that and, and figuring out how you do that in your way. So has this has the civil unrest and, and the com talks about social justice in in the world prompted any ideas for you on how you're going to address some of this stuff in your classroom this year? Um, to be honest with you, I've so I've been thinking about that a lot um, because I had last year some students who wouldn't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, mm. and um, mm. you know, had that been let me put it this way. Had that been five years ago, I would have had a big, big issue with it. You know, I'd have been like, you need to stand up. Like, this is the United States. If I was, you know, in Mexico, I would stand up. Like, regardless. Yeah. Like, um, I, so, but, you know, this last year, we kind of had a talk after it. Like, the whole class, we all kind of got together as to why they wouldn't stand. And I just want to see if they even knew the reason, you know, and what they thought about it. And um, a lot of them, it's, it was eye-opening because they, do knew, they, they knew the reasons they weren't going to stand. Mm. Whether it be because, um, you know, they just didn't feel like they were being treated equally or they, it wasn't fair that some kids have this and they don't have nothing. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, it was very eye-opening to me. Um, 
and they, they you know, they're citizens too, you know, yeah. and even if they're not citizens, we're here in our country, we need to take care of them. Like, so I guess I, I mean, we, we touched on it a little bit for the future. I don't exactly know what I'm going to do to, you know what I mean? To try to teach them all, you know, equality and for everybody. But um, I think my students, for the most part, they get along in my classroom. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter their color. Like, you know, like they're, they've been very, um, they're respectful. They may not like each other, but they respect each other. Yeah. Yeah. Point. And, you know, and then that's the, the beauty is that schools can create a safe environment. Schools, schools can be incubators for to teach socialization, for how you engage people with different backgrounds and, and schools can promote the humanity in each other. Right. So in your classroom, you can help kids see their the humanity, no matter where they come from, their background. We're all in here together. We're working together. That's a that's a human being, just like you're a human being. And we're all deserving of love and respect. And, and that message alone, I think if we all did more of that, it would undo a lot that's going on. And, 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 and so one, I want to give you uh, kudos for even evolving your um your stance or your perception of the kneeling right um because the important thing is that we need to listen to each other like that's the important thing the important thing is that um and, and you gave your kids a voice and you gave them a platform and you allowed them to express their points of view and i'm sure in that you also learned some things you know i think the te the teacher also sometimes is a student i think we're all forever students and we all need to continue learning and listening to each other and, and evolving. You know, we don't have, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like people change, but I do believe people evolve and we can evolve who we are. Uh, so I give you, so I give, I, 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 I commend you. And I think that's also a testament to why you're a teacher, right? That, that, and, and you, and you, um, because you see your kids as, as worthy human beings that are worth being listened to. You know, and don't come in with judgment because often what happens is we bring our own implicit implicit biases into the classroom environment and and that and that causes a disconnect, you know, and that and we have to sit with the not only just with each other, but also kids, because kids do have a perspective. And I think people often devalue or undervalue um what how much kids know, you know, and what they're experiencing. Because in your classroom, they may be getting along well, but then they all have a world that they go out into. And that world they go out into may not be as kind, you know, it may not be no, as not. Yeah. as just as the environment that you're creating. So I think it was very important, very powerful that you that you did give them a platform and that you did listen and 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 trying to give them a place. Cause we see we don't often see that happen, especially like in our national politics. You know, you'll have people explain what this is about and 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 people will still not listen and they'll kind of pigeonhole into their idea of it instead of listening to each other. And so I, I what I'm hoping comes out of 2020 is that we that we learn to listen to each other better, um, that we learn to um, see things from other people's perspectives and not just ours. Because uh, because I think that's how we really move forward. But we have to talk to people that aren't like us. Like we have to. We can't just live in a vacuum with only people that regurgitate our ideas. We don't grow that way, you know. Um,